Hi, Tim. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Not bad. It's hot and humid here. But... It's hot and humid here. Not coincidentally. We're, in this, we're both on the northeast uh, coast, yeah. and it's bad. Life's bad. Yeah, it's going to get worse, too. It is. Uh, but we're not the kind to complain. Uh, so we'd rather talk philosophy. You're a philosopher, a professor of philosophy at, the, at New York University. Um, you've written books with titles like Quantum Non-Locality and Relativity, the metaphysics within physics, truth and paradox. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things today. In particular, I want to talk about time, the nature of time. And then if we have uh, time, as they say, um, we'll uh, talk about something called quantum entanglement, which is one of the weirder aspects of quantum physics, or at least seemingly weird. Um, now, as for this time thing, I guess we could describe your views on time as either conventional or unconventional, depending on whether we compare them to a layperson's view or a lot of physicists' views, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're, you think that uh, a view of time that's common within physics, maybe even the mainstream view, I don't know, is wrong. Is that fair to say? That's pretty fair to say. Okay. Now, let me give you three uh, questions about time all of which will probably strike lay people as odd uh, for one reason or another. I think, I think they get at the heart of the question. In fact, I think they may be seen as the same question. One question I have is, are, are all these three questions the same question from your point of view? So, okay, one is, is time real? That seems like a strange question to a lay person. Seems mm-hmm. pretty obvious it's real. Yeah. Does, time, does time have a direction? Mm-hmm. That seems pretty obvious to a lay person. We tend yeah. to move into the future. Um, is time more fundamental than space? That may seem odd because it's like, what the hell does that mean? I mean, time and space are just both here. Let's yeah. live with it. It's like I don't look at my chair and table and ask which is more fundamental. They're both just here. <laughs> right? So, are the, first of all, are those basically the same question, those three questions? They're certainly related, right? Um, yeah, they're related. I wouldn't say that. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. No problem. It happens. All right. Um, I wouldn't it happens twice sometimes. Yeah, I can't. I, I'm sorry. I've it's just, it's the, it's the world's most relentless telemarketer. It is. In fact, I don't want to pick up, and they won't go away. Maybe we should just invite them onto the show. Yeah. Uh, so that's what happens to time, right? You lose it. Um, yeah. I don't think they're the same question. They're related. It, obviously, if time isn't real then there aren't many other questions you can ask about it, right? Unreal things. It's like asking how much the Loch Ness Monster weighs. Well, if there is no Loch Ness Monster, there are no further interesting questions about it. But, but, um, but, but, aren't there, but aren't there a lot of physicists who would say there's a sense in which time isn't real, or am I wrong? The, yeah, look, physicists like fancy-sounding things that will blow your mind. So they say all kinds of stuff. Okay. Um, I'm, as you say, for the most part, I'm with the guy in the street or the girl in the street on all this, um, I would say, sure, of course time is real. Time is obviously an aspect and a very fundamental aspect of the physical world. It's also an aspect of the mental world, interestingly. It's maybe the one thing that seems to be in common between the physical world and the mental world. If you you think about Descartes, Descartes was sitting there in Meditation 1 and he managed to doubt whether he had a body, and he managed to doubt whether there was an external world. But he never managed to doubt whether time was going on or whether he was having thoughts in temporal sequence. So you think time is the most fundamental feature of everything we think exists, which means if it isn't real, we're in a whole lot of trouble. Um, I think, yes, it's real. Now, Second question about the direction. You could think it's real, but think it's not fundamentally directed. So if you think about a spatial direction like north and south, you don't have the feeling that uh, the direction from north to south, right, an arrow pointing from north to south, is any more uh, accurate or real or descriptive of that dimension than one pointing the other way from south to north. So you would say that uh, spatial dimensions don't seem to be directed. But we all know for sure that time isn't like that, that 
uh, well, the, the you know, direction from mean, now into the future. Well, but, but aren't, aren't there physicists who don't know that for sure? I mean, that is the natural intuition, but isn't a big part of what you're saying related to the fact that a pretty common interpretation in physics is that the directionality of time is is less is in a sense less fundamental to time than it seems to be. Yes. The, the that, time that, is actually that, is more like a spatial dimension. I mean that that's yeah. a view that 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 as it happens, for whatever reason, we have this idea that you can only move in one direction. Uh, but that may just be some kind of I don't know what they would say. It's a byproduct of the way the human mind is designed or something. But it's 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 actually in some sense illusory. Yeah, that's a, of course many physicists do say that. Um, if you go back to Jules Verne and the time machine in the in the first chapter of the time machine, there's exactly this idea. He says, "Well, okay, we know there are three dimensions. Uh, you can think of them as um, up, down." right, left, and backward or forward, or something like that. And isn't time just a fourth dimension? And then he goes on to say, well, we can move at will, either up or down, or back or forth, or left or right, so why can't we just move at will in the two directions of time? And that gets the whole time machine science fiction genre off to a, off to a running start. Uh, so there is a kind of very simple but also simplistic and simple-minded argument that goes, oh, uh, really the world is four-dimensional because we have to give four numbers to specify an event. We have to give a latitude, a longitude, an altitude, and a time to tell you exactly where and when something happened. So that's four dimensions. So why aren't they all really the same? And can't, why can't we do the same? You know, then it seems to be puzzling why time seems different than space. But I think that's just a bad analogy. You just started off on the wrong foot. Nobody thinks. But, but didn't but didn't Einstein kind of say that that we should treat time more just like another dimension? Um, I don't know. In his popular works, I would have to go check whether he said anything like that. Um, the actual mathematical structure of the theory of relativity does not suggest that in the least. Just the opposite. Um, but, but but this is commonly said, right? Yeah. That, mm -hmm. So, so yes, you, you think, is, unfortunately. I mean, you, I, I gather you think that Einstein is misunderstood in a number of ways. Um, but 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 th you're saying this is one because he because here's what I've heard is that there is this thing called the block universe, and I thought that it was associated with Einstein. And but in any event, the idea is, um, as we said, time is just a. Uh, 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 Another dimension like space, one implication of this, I gather, is determinism. In other words, like uh, in space, even though I haven't traveled very far north today and I don't know what is there, what is there is already fixed and, and set. It, it, it's like, and, and similarly, the future, I haven't traveled there yet, but if it's just like a spatial dimension, what is there is fixed and set. So that, that would be a form of determinism. And, you know, determinism doesn't necessarily imply that, that time is like reversible. I mean, I mean, they're not entirely the same question, but I gather that, um, is, am I, am I right so far? Is this the standard thing that is said about, about the Einsteinian universe? Leaving aside the question whether it's what he said, am I right in thinking that this is what I would read in a popular physics book? There's this block universe, uh, Time, and there are two implications, actually. The future has, in a sense, already happened, or at least uh, it's, nothing's, nothing's really going to change it. And then the second uh, uh, implication is that, in principle at least, you could go backward in time. Um, I would say, whether you would see that in a physics book, I'm not quite sure. You'd certainly read it in a lot of popularizing uh, okay. texts. And I think you would hear a lot of physicists and a fair number of philosophers saying words just like those that you just said. Um, I don't think you could trace any of it back to Einstein myself. I don't think Einstein, I'm trying to think, I don't think Einstein, it ever crossed his mind to question the, whether there was uh, a direction of time. It's an odd thing to question, after all. Um, there's, there are very straightforward facts about how the structure of space and time or space-time is different 
in the theory of relativity than in, in classical physics, the kind of physics that Newton did. And you can talk about that, but um, Newton certainly assumed there was a preferred direction of time. He didn't really think it was worthwhile remarking on it. I mean, mm-hmm. It's so obvious. Why, why would you even make the comment? And my guess is Einstein thought the same way. Something a little extraordinary has to happen to even think it's worth making a deal out of that time goes from past to future in a very okay. asymmetric kind okay, of Okay, but this thing seems to have happened in the brains of some actual physicists. I mean, leave, oh, aside, yeah. what I, leave aside what Einstein said. A lot of actual physicists, including some smart ones, would say, I gather, that uh, time is in principle reversible or in principle has no direction. As it happens, we're accustomed to traveling in one direction, but uh, that's just the way we, we are, right? Yeah, you, you, I, look, I can't dispute the sociology you're giving me. You'll hear lots okay, so, of people so they, why are they, 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 they say it, sure. So I think it's all wrong, but I, they'll, they'll say it, sure. So before we ask why you think they're wrong, let's get clear on your view. Is your view just basically the commonsensical view? Time, you can either view it as something that flows inexorably past or, or it kind of is a dimension that we travel inexorably on in one, di- in one direction. But either way, that, that intuition is just correct, and that's kind of the end of the story. Is that your view? For the direction of time, yeah. The, 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 the view is that time, we, we all understand. If you just go, you know, slap somebody awake in the middle of the night and ask them, hey, does time pass? Um, they'll be confused about why you woke them up, but they'll say, of course it does. Why are you asking me that? So it's certainly every everybody's view that time passes. It's everybody's view that we are constantly getting older, that we're getting further from our births, that we are unfortunately getting closer to our deaths, uh, that there's an inexorable march of time. All of those things are everyday platitudes that everybody believes. I happen to think everybody's right. Uh, I think time is intrinsically directed. Now, I do think the structure of time is not what the person in the street thinks it is, and you have to study some relativity to understand why the picture of the structure of time is different in relativity than it is in kind of everyday thought, which is closer to what Newton believed. Um, But that's that's more playing at the edges of the thing than certainly not going to the central aspect that time uh, is a directed kind of thing. Is it possible to say in a way a layperson would understand what you think is different about Einstein's conception of time and, sure. as opposed to the layperson's conception? Yes, absolutely. So let me, um, let me talk about one of the things everybody's heard about relativity, which is the twins paradox. So everybody probably is a little bit familiar with this idea that in relativity you could have two identical twins born together, they grew up together, they're obviously, you would say, the same age. Uh, one of them gets into a rocket and blasts off and goes on some kind of trip and comes back, and when the twins get back together, biologically they are no longer the same age. One seems very old and decrepit, the other is still young and lively. Uh, the old and decrepit one has lots and lots, years and years of memories, and the young and lively one has only a year's worth of memories, and the clocks that they carried with them, their pocket watches, also disagree in exactly the same way, and every sort of physical procedure we think of as being clock-like disagree in terms of the amount of elapsed time between when they separated and when they got back together. And you see that in, you know, popular movies and so on. And that is a fact. We know that's a fact because we can do the experiments and with really nice, high quality precision clocks. They've, can, they've actually sent the clocks out into space and done the experiment. They, they originally did the experiments way back when in the 70s by putting some atomic clocks just on airplanes and flying them around the world in opposite directions. Uh, nowadays, and the, the, the clocks are so much more accurate, just orders and orders of magnitude more accurate that you can pick up these effects uh, trivially, and we know that they're there. We know that's just a fact about the world. Now, if you're an everyday person, you're very puzzled about this, because you say, well, look, they were together, and their clocks were synchronized, and then whatever they did in the meantime, the same amount of time passed, 
and then they got back together so their clocks ought to still be synchronized, right? That's the everyday view. And I think there's a very, very, very simple analogy, which in fact is mathematically extremely accurate, um, to give you the idea of what happens in relativity. So the right thing to say is that in relativity, you should think of a clock more like the odometer on your car. So if you have two cars that were built in the same factory and driven side by side and had obviously the same reading on their odometers, and then all of a sudden uh, they go off on different roads, and sometime later they get back together, and maybe one went on the highway and the other went on the scenic route, um, you're not at all puzzled that when they get back together, their odometers no longer show the same amount of elapsed mileage and that the tires on the one are more worn down and there's more uh, wear and tear on the engine. Uh, I mean, there's that just, you, you think, yeah, of course, they went by different paths and the paths were different lengths and the odometers were measuring the lengths. And so, of course, they start out synchronized or they start out, you know, showing the same amount of mileage and they end up showing different amounts. It's that trivial. That's all that happens in relativity. Yeah, but it's it's not trivial because the intuition is that time is not like space. We can all understand why it happens in space with an odometer, but it, the, we thought that time was this thing that moved past inexorably at the same rate, at an even rate. I mean, I, I guess... Right. And the, the, uh, I mean, it's, it's the physicists you disagree with who would say, right, you're playing into my argument by, by comparing the dimension of time to the dimension of space. That's our point. They're the, they're the same kind of dimensions, right? No, I mean, they're not the same kinds of dimensions because clocks only measure time. That clocks just <laughs> aren't, you know, they're like odometers, but they aren't odometers. And the thing about rates, I mean, look, an odo- the, the odometers on my two cars. Uh, work at the same rate. That is, they register one mile per mile if they're working mm-hmm. well. They, their, their little dials click up one mile for every mile they've passed. Uh, it's not that one odometer is measuring differently than the other odometer. They're, if they're both working perfectly, they measure the same quantity, and it happens that that quantity is different along the two different routes. And the same thing for clocks, right? In the twins' case, it's not that one clock is doing the wrong thing both clocks are doing just what they're designed to do. They're, they're designed to measure what we call the proper time along their paths through space-time. Mm-hmm. And the clocks take two different paths, and the paths have different lengths, and they register different lengths. Okay, but, but isn't there a different sense in which the, the twin thing kind of uh, helps, somewhat corroborates this block universe idea? Because the idea is... There is a point of view. From one of the twins' points of view, the future has already happened. The fact that you can't see the future is a function of your own situation. But there is a point of view from which the future uh, has happened. The one twin is further into the future, right? Well, I, I don't know what that means. From nobody's point of view, has the future already happened, or they wouldn't call it the future. Things that have already happened, everybody calls Well, but the one twin, uh, another way to put it is what the two twins mean by the future is, in a sense, different. One's, one of the twins is, in a certain sense, further into the future, right? Mm, well, I, well I, I'm going to have to ask you when. I mean, <laughs> well. the, okay, let me, let me help out here a bit. All right? Well, uh, well I, I mean, I guess I would say the one twin doesn't yet have gray hair. The gray hair is in <laughs> that twin's future, whereas the other twin has lived the future in which the twin has gray hair. Oh, uh, the I I, I don't the, I, I I actually don't think one can make a lot of sense out of the words that just came. Let me try something because I was trying to make this all sound very prosaic, right? With the odometer analogy, which actually is really, really, really accurate. Um, the the thing that's missing from relativity is the notion of simultaneity. So your, your thought is, your everyday thought is, if I snap my fingers like that, that was an event that just happened here. And you can ask in a perfectly sensible way, at that moment when you snapped your fingers, what was going on in the next room and what was going on in the next city and what was going on on Mars and what was going on on Alpha Centauri and so on, that there's a fact about which other events happened quote, at the very same time as my finger snap. 
So that's built into Newton's view of absolute time. And that's sort of, that's really built into the everyday notion of time. And that's what gets thrown out in relativity. I mean, people often say that in relativity, simultaneity is relative, but the right thing to say is that in relativity, there just is no simultaneity. It's non-existent. There's no... Because there is no single privileged perspective. You're, uh, uh, for well, there, yeah, it's just, I mean, I don't know why people bring perspectives into it. It's just in the actual geometrical structure of space-time in that theory, there is no such structure. There's no structure that corresponds to what we think of as absolute simultaneity. So it's gone, right? Just get rid of it. Um, and that's, you know, that causes you to change some of your views about time, although quite honestly not ones that are going to affect you in your everyday life to any particular extent. Okay, so you've, you've talked about uh, what... What Einstein, how Einstein's conception of time differs from the, the intuitive conception. Now, how is it that these mainstream contemporary physicists who you think are wrong, what is it that they believe about time, in your own words, that you think is, is it, well, that first of all departs from our intuition and that you think is wrong? Well, the first thing they think is that, that there is no intrinsic fundamental directionality to time. And what is the practical meaning of that, by the way? I mean, they don't mean that we actually know how to go back in time, but they, they think that someday there could actually be a technology that permits it in principle. Is that an implication? It's not. It, there's no reason why that should be an implication. Um, I, I'll tell you, I, instead of telling you what they're thinking, because quite honestly, um, there are some cases where you can just pin down, here's a mistake that's being made, and sometimes it's just kind of a thicket of confusion, and it's not very easy to sort out. Um, let me tell you why I think they fell into it, and maybe that will help. And the reason they fell into it was that they're using, in describing space and time, and once you get to relativity, you have to do them both together. You're describing the structure of this one gadget we call space-time. And in mathematical physics, of course, you use mathematical structures to describe these things. And it turns out that the mathematical structure that was used maybe not very surprisingly, that was already sitting on the shelf that everybody was already familiar with was a gadget that had been designed just to, de just to describe space. So when people realized that there were possible spatial geometries besides Euclid's, so they, they discovered non-Euclidean geometries and then geometries of variable curvature, so this was something that, that Riemann did, and they developed a whole new set of mathematical tools to describe these very different spatial geometries. Now, space doesn't have a directionality. So if you're designing a mathematical gadget to describe spatial geometry, you have no need for any directionality. And so, of course, you don't put any into it. And then if you say, ah, now I'm not describing space, but I'm describing space time. Right. And you grab this gadget off the shelf that was already there and you use it, well, not too surprisingly, it's not going to seem to have a direction in it because you didn't, you're grabbing a gadget that didn't have a direction in it. And then you, if you take the math too seriously and don't think hard about where it came from, you can even convince yourself there must not really be any time because I don't see it in my approach. Now, are you saying that this is what Einstein did? Because what you just described does correspond to the standard layperson's explanation of what Einstein did, namely that he said... The way to think about gravity is not about two, two distant objects exerting some mysterious influence on one another, but just think of a, uh, a, a four-dimensional space-time continuum and the heavy objects uh, warp the, the, or, or affect the curvature of the texture of this four-dimensional thing such that they roll or something. Anyway, but the point is he seems to be integrating the dimension of time into an existing ge geometric conception, three-dimensional geometric conception, in a way that makes it actually impossible to conceive, because all the illustrations of the, of the balls <laughs> are always three-dimensional. The, 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 the things you see illustrating the supposedly four-dimensional continuum are always three-dimensional, because we can't conceive of a four-dimensional continuum. But in any event, are you, to some extent, critiquing what Einstein himself did? Because it sounds like you're describing what Einstein did. No, not, not in the okay. least. So let me also say a little bit about what's going on there. Um, so you start out when you do geometry doing Euclidean geometry, and you learn all kinds of facts of Euclidean geometry that the interior angles of a triangle always equal 180 degrees and this and that. And then 
you eventually learn that there are non-Euclidean geometries like the geometry of the surface of the Earth or spherical geometry. So you can imagine, for example, on the surface of the Earth, if you start at the North Pole and just walk straight down to the equator and then take a right turn and walk a quarter way around the equator and then take another right turn and walk right back up to the North Pole, and there's a right angle now between how you started out and how you ended up. So now I have a triangle that has three right angles in it, okay? So it obviously adds up to more than two right angles. Um, that's something that can't happen in, in Euclid's geometry and can happen. And that's because of curvature. So the way you end up having a general purpose gadget for describing all of these different geometries is talking about uh, the geometry having curvature uh, either positive or negative or zero. And Euclidean geometry is just the geometry of constant zero curvature and, uh, and so on. So th that whole idea that you can have different amounts of curvature is what Einstein takes over and runs and, and constructs, a, again, an almost perfect mathematical analogy. So the way the analogy goes is as the, the analog to Euclidean geometry, which is the geometry of zero curvature, is the space-time of special relativity. So it's a flat space-time, and, and it shows no, no gravitational effects. And the way you build gra gravity, what we call gravity into the theory, is by changing the geometry of space-time to make it curved. The amount of curvature depends on how much matter and energy there is, how much stress and energy there is. And so Einstein writes an equation down for this. And in those terms, he's able to explain why the planets orbit the sun and why Mercury doesn't orbit quite the way that Newton predicted it would orbit and things like that and why light gets bent when it passes near the sun. All of this just falls out of it. And I have no complaints about that at all. That, again, none of that ha has anything to say one way or the other about whether time has an intrinsic direction. And you can take all of that on board and still insist that time is intrinsically directed. And as I said, in relativity, there are, so at any given point in space time, there are different directions. You can think of them as arrows sticking out in different directions. And in relativity, those arrows have different characters. And we, what we would normally say is at any given point, there are five different types of directions you can go in. You can go in the future time-like direction, which sort of, if you imagine these pictures of a light cone, which has an event at the center and then a kind of double cone, I guess most people have seen pictures like that, where the, there's one called the future light cone and one called the past light cone. And so we have directions that point into the future light cone. Those are future time-like directions. We have directions that point on the future light cone. Those are future null or light-like directions. We have space-like directions, which is all this whole big bunch of stuff around the outside. Then we have the past null directions along the past light cone and the past time-like directions into the past light cone. So that's five different kinds of directions. And that is part of the fundamental space-time geometry, <clears throat> according to relativity. Nobody would dispute that. So you're not treating space and time the same. In particular, every space-like direction can be rotated into every other one while staying within the space-like directions. But you can't get from time-like future to time-like past without going through space-like, okay? I can't get from within this upper cone, pointing within the upper cone, to pointing within the lower cone without exiting the cones. Okay. So just that tells you that space-like directions are treated differently at a mathematical level than time-like directions. Space and time are not the same in relativity. So, so you're, you're saying that, that a lot of modern physicists are confused. They are, they are, in their minds, exaggerating the extent to which mo modern physics, including Einstein's view of the world, implies that time is a dimension with, with, with dimensions, with properties exactly like the, the spatial dimension. Yes, if anybody who says that is ignorant of physics. But, but, but well, not only that, but you're, you're suggesting that they tend to believe that, I gather. Well, you know, belief is a 
interesting word here. No physicist <laughs> would, would, would question anything I just said about these five different directions. No, no competent physicist would say I've said anything even vaguely controversial. Mm-hmm. Now, together with that, they'll sometimes repeat these kind of gloss stories, these gloss non-technical stories that they've themselves heard a million times in books they've read and growing up, and they tend to just go on autopilot and repeat them. And, uh, you know, it's just my observation that if you grab them by the lapels and say, look, the little gloss story you just told is not consistent with what you know, they'll kind of go, oh, yeah, you're right. Well, well have yeah, you, not, have you, not a big deal, but they're, but they're just being sloppy. That's all. Have you convinced any of them? Have you, do you have any complete converts to your credit? In other words, you grab them by the lapels and you get them to reconceive their ideas about time itself and they move in. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I've had some, I, I had a guy, I, there are several people, but I'll just say this because it came out of the blue, right? Um, I published this book on philosophy of physics, space, and time, which is just laying out physics views of space time. And I just, I got an email from a guy who's actually the chair of a, of a physics department. And he said that he and his colleagues were sitting around the table having lunch and he had been reading my book and went over basically what I just told you about the twins paradox. And he said, you know, I realized I've been teaching that wrong all my career. I, and there are other people who've said that too. They read the book and they say, oh my God, I've been teaching that wrong. What had he been saying that was wrong, do you know? Yeah, sure. If, if you go and read Richard Feynman's lectures on physics, which is a very, very, I mean, it's a beautiful set of lectures, and 99% of the time, uh, Feynman... This, this is that. not the book, The Character of Physical Law, this is the... No, no, this is the, 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 the uh, set of lectures that he gave at okay. Caltech that were then put into these three volumes. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the character of physical law is also a set of lectures. It, it's really good, but it's, uh, I haven't, then I haven't read what you're talking about. I mean, this is, the, uh, this is a class lecture. It's not a, you know, a lecture. Okay, okay not public lectures. Okay. He's teaching introductory physics okay. to, the, to, to the freshmen and doing it his way rather than the normal way. And many of the things he says are different than the normal way, and they're very insightful. It just happens that when he goes over the twins' paradox, he makes this mistake. Uh, and I'm sure... And what is the mistake, in, in just quickly, in, in, a, in a sentence, what well, is the mistake? Well, well, the mistake he makes is he says that the whole twins paradox has something to do with acceleration, with which twin accelerates. That if you want to know, he says the big puzzle is, why does one twin end up older than the other? Because isn't everything really symmetric between them? And if everything's symmetric between them, then then why is there this asymmetry that one ends up older than the other? And he adds to this the mistaken notion that in relativity, motion is relative. That's just false. Uh, and Newton could have told him it was false. Um, and then he says, oh, the way to resolve... Newton, but Newton didn't really understand relativity, did he? <laughs> Newton understood very well why motion was not relative. And okay. he gave a beautiful, beautiful. Okay, argument. I'll take your word for that. So then, then continue with what Feinstein uh, with Feinstein's confusion. Uh, Feynman, I mean, Feynman uh, yeah, answers, sorry, oh, the, the resolution to this is that one twin accelerates and the other doesn't, and that's just false because you can set up situations where they both accelerate the same amount and one ends up older than the other, and you can set up situations where the one that accelerates more ends up younger than the other, and the one that accelerates more ends up older than the other. <laughs> it's just the the solution to this doesn't have to do with acceleration. And that's what Feynman says, and he's just wrong about it. And if you haven't tumbled to the fact that Feynman was wrong about that, then you haven't thought the thing through. But, but, but if at some point their velocities aren't different, then the effect doesn't happen, right? I thought... Uh, there's really... It, in relativity, there's no such thing as your velocity. So ask right now. Let me just ask you a straightforward question. Sure. What well, do you think your velocity is right now? What my velocity is? Yeah, what's your velocity? Well, this is obviously a trick question, so I refuse to answer. The naive answer would be whatever velocity the Earth is spinning at, but you would say, wait, relative to what point of reference? And I'd go, uh, uh, center of the Earth? And you'd go, no, there's no point of reference. Although, although I just thought you said earlier to explain relativity in terms of there being no privileged point of reference was wrong, so maybe that isn't what you'd say. So what is the wrong answer to the trick question? And the, what is your devastating right. response? The, the, so, Newton believed, let's just to have a contrast here. <clears throat> Newton believed and gave an art, beautiful argument for, anybody there should go read the Scolium on Space and Time, 
uh, that there was, at any given moment, every object had an absolute velocity. There was a state of absolute rest. Now, you can't tell by any laboratory experiment whether something's at absolute rest. It had this kind of ghostly quality, but Newton couldn't see any way to get, get, get around it. He was wrong about that, and everybody understands. And it's correct. Nothing has an absolute velocity. There are no, you can't ask. It, one way to put it that most people would be happy with, I'm not so crazy about it, but just to please what people will understand, is to say right now, you are traveling at 99.9999999% the speed of light in some perfectly acceptable reference frame. In some reference frame that's as good as any other reference frame, you are now just a scooch below going the speed of light. Because that reference frame, relative to me, is moving almost at the speed of light. Yeah. Right. Okay. A, particle go, a particle zips by you, mm -hmm. going, as you would say, nearly the speed of light. And from the particle's point of view, you're going nearly the speed of light. Well, and from, from the point right of view of a photon, I am moving at the speed of light, right? It's photons even... are special. Let's not get photons. <laughs> photons are tricky. Okay. Uh, so there are no, there are no speed. There, you, things don't have velocities. Mm -hmm. So if they don't have velocities, then you can't sensibly ask whether two things have the same velocity, right? If there are no velocities, then there's no fact about whether things have the same or different velocities. Okay. Which is where you started, right? You said, oh, if they're going the same velocity. That, yeah. That's not a really sensible thing to say. Oh, I, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, yeah. You, no, I feel bad. I'm crazy. sorry. I really... I really want to make amends somehow. Um, so, uh, well, maybe we should move on uh, a little. Uh, let's let's distinguish between um, the reversibility question and the determinism question. It seems mm -hmm. to me that the block universe, as conventionally presented, implies both. That, like, right now, the past is out there, the future is out there. I can't see them. But actually, they're all kind of there in the way that the spatial dimensions that I can't see are there. At least that's the way it's conventionally uh, conveyed in popular books. Um, mm -hmm. to, uh, again, two implications. One is that the past is there. I, in principle, you could go, there's a time's reversible. But leave that aside. Uh, another implication is the future has already happened. So, not, so you don't have the option of doing something now that's going to change the future. In other words, uh, the future is determined. So this would seem to to rule out free will as conventionally interpreted and so on. And the point I'm making is that you could believe in the direction of time. So get rid of the block uh, universe writ large and yet still be a determinist, right? Yes. Still think the future is inevitable, if you'll pardon the imprecision of expression there. So um, let, let's see. Um and again, I, 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 this sounds like I'm being mean to you. You're just repeating things you've read a hundred times. Basically, everything, every single statement you said up to here was confused. Um, and but, but, well, no, I prefaced it. Wait wait, 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 wait. I prefaced it with the view you would see in standard yes. popular accounts. Absolutely. That, Absolutely. that means it's correct, right? Yeah, that what is, I said is correct. that's correct. People talk that right. way, and it makes sense. But you're sense. not being mean to me, so I'm not at all okay. offended yeah. or insulted, so you yeah. need to apologize. So determinism is usually understood not as a matter of space-time structure at all. In other words, I could tell you about the structure of space-time and then ask you, is this a deterministic universe, and you shrug your shoulders and say, how am I supposed to know? You haven't told me enough. What normally determines whether we live in a deterministic universe are the laws of physics, the laws that, that uh, govern the behavior of things. And either those are deterministic laws, meaning from some initial state, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they only allow one sequence of things to follow. Right. Or they're indeterministic, and from some initial state, they allow many different things to, right. to, to, to happen and usually give different probabilities for various mm -hmm. kinds of things. Now, knowing you could know everything there is to know about space-time and to simply not know whether the world is deterministic because you haven't given me the information, which has to do with the laws of physics. Um, so right. that idea that any view about space-time either implies or forbids 
determinism or indeterminism is just again it's on the wrong it's on the wrong you're foot. saying the block universe as conventionally presented time is just like space kind of that does not imply determinism correct it doesn't it does not you can you can i i that i just don't get intuitively uh, but because i i thought the idea was yeah the time uh, you know it is like space you can't see what's in the past you can't see what's i mean you have records of what's in the okay. past you can't see it you can't visit it now you can't visit the future now but they exist in fact simultaneously in some sense maybe but but they exist uh even as we speak in a sense the way spatial uh, expanses exist and if that's the case then the future is set um yeah so let me let me try and give you an analogy so you see what's wrong with it. If I give you um, some laws of physics, like Newton's laws of physics, there are many models of those laws. That is, as far as Newton's laws go, there are lots of ways the world could go. I mean, are there going to be 10 stars, 100 stars, 12 planets, no planets? Is it all dust? All of these are consistent with Newton's laws. So we have all of these solutions to Newton's laws, and that each one represents a possible physical world according to Newton. Okay? And those physical worlds could be mapped out from the beginning of time to the end of time. So imagine we have a room with all these models, right? These four-dimensional models. Here's a world according to Newton. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another yep. one. They're all in this room. Now, what determinism says is that you can't find two models whose, as it were, who match at the bottom part, but then right. diverge toward the top. Right. If they match at the bottom, they match everywhere. Right. If, if all the facts of the universe are as they are now, right. then, then one what's going to be the case in a year can right. only be one case. That's right. Okay. Now, that, it, it's perfectly consistent with the block view as you've uh, said it, that I can go through the room and find, no, here are two models, and they match up to here, and then they, then they diverge. And so that would be an indeterministic universe. Well, I guess the, 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 my intuitive conception of the block universe then is, is wrong. I mean, I think it's a widespread one, though. It is. Um, it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. it, it has no... Look, the, the block I mean, do you think the physicists themselves who say they believe in the block universe are confused in exactly the way I am? Or yes. if there is a difference? The physicists aren't confused, the lay people are. No, I think the physicists are confused. Oh, okay. Well, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm in good company. I mean, um, let, me, let, me, let me give you... Doris Day famously sang, Que sera, sera, sera. What will be, right? will be. What the will future be, is be. not ours to see. Exactly. Now, that's true. It's, in fact, trivially true that what will be, will be. That is a tautology. That is not a statement of determinism. Determinism is not trivial. It might be true. It might be false. But whether it's true or false, what will be, will be. Right. And that's all the block universe says is what will be, will be, and what was, was. Yeah, big deal. Okay, I don't want to dwell uh, unduly on this, um, but uh, we could get into the question of Einstein and his determinism. I know you think Einstein's determinism has been, in a sense, misrepresented. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we need to necessarily go here, but um, in the sense that you think his his the the sources of his skepticism about prevailing interpretations of quantum physics, you think did not have as much to do with his being a determinist. No, I don't think it's commonly to do with presented. Being a determinist. But but you do think he was a determinist? Um I think he he thought he had good empirical reason for being a determinist. It's not that he had a prejudice. What he realized was that given some of the predictions of quantum mechanics, you had a choice. And the choice was if you believed that the world was indeterministic, then necessarily you would also have to believe that there was what he called spooky action at a distance. That, that something that happens here could have an effect at arbitrarily far away instantaneously. And he thought that was inconsistent with relativity. Okay. So he, he thought there were two packages that were available. Right. You could have indeterminism and spooky action at a distance, or you could have determinism and no spooky action at a distance. And he thought any sane person would take the second package, not because of the determinism, but because of the no spooky action in the distance. So, so the standard quote where, where he says, uh, God does not play dice, 
at best represents an is an incomplete description of his actual motivation for skepticism about quantum physics. Okay, so let me tell you a story. Okay. I was doing a paper exactly about this, and I Googled, God does not play dice. And I don't know if this is still true, but the following was true. I came up with at least with dozens of hits that had a quote from Einstein that went, that God plays dice, dot, 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 I cannot believe for a minute. Now, the dot, dot, dot represented something that people had systematically sliced out of the middle of that sentence. They had taken it out. They had edited it out. They had thrown it away. They had made it so it looked like Einstein said, I can't believe that God plays dice. If you go and look at what, how you fill that out, the complete quote is, it's hard to sneak a, good, a look at God's cards, but that God plays dice and uses telepathic methods as the present quantum theory requires, I cannot believe for a minute. Mm -hmm. Indeterminism went with spooky action at a distance. They went hand in glove for Einstein, and what he hated was <clears throat> spooky action at a distance. Okay. He has been systematically misrepresented in his beliefs. So then so let's show that they could be dismissed. Okay. So then let's talk about uh, that part of his objection. Let's talk a little about entanglement. I mean, um, first of all, you know, yeah, he did have a well-known aversion to spooky action at a distance. I gather one reason he was happy with relativity is now you can describe gravity without talking about two distant objects, you know, in, uh, con conveying some right. kind of spooky influence on one another. It was They were just rolling along the landscape of space-time. The, the, um, uh, in, in which case, all the influence is local. That's um, right. But, but, um, so, so, but entanglement, uh, is, is, uh, something that he, uh, the entanglement as, as it is conventionally interpreted by most physicists is something that he, uh, he kind of thought couldn't be the case. It was too ridiculous yeah. to be the case. It is, it is yeah. the, tel the, the telepathy you're, you're kind of referring to. Yeah. So let me give you my understanding of entanglement as it's currently, um, it's, it's conventionally presented. I think we have to say one thing at the beginning that there is this idea in quantum physics that measuring something can in some cases force it to assume kind of in some sense uh, definite or distinct uh, form. The standard example is like an electron. If you ask, well, where was it right before you measured it? And there isn't a, that kind of clear answer the layperson would assume. You can say, well, we know for sure there's a 50% probability that when you measure it will be here, a 30% probability here, 20% here. But you say, okay, but like where is it right before I measure it? And then they go like, well, you could think of it as like uh, being in all of these places or not, but, 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 but it just isn't in one place until you measure it. This at least is conventionally said. Then you measure it. And this curve of probabilities, the, the, the superposition, the, the, the wave of probabilities, uh, in some sense collapses on a definite answer. This is where the electron is. So, so there is this idea in quantum physics that uh, measurement, um, well, I, I, let's just say it forces things to assume uh, a state that they didn't, in, 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 as we think of it, have right before that now. Uh, I'll continue, and if I'm making mistakes, you can correct them after the fact. But with entanglement, so you imagine these two particles that have a, a particular relationship. They are entangled, and the laws of physics compel that their states have to be, I guess, complementary. Like these two particles, let's say that the two kinds of states are heads and tails. I mean, technically, they usually talk about what's called spin, but let's say you can measure a particle it's either heads or tails. If it's heads, that means its twin particle is going to have to be tails. If it's tails, that means its twin particle is going to have to be heads, right? That's, well, you want to interject something now? Uh, well, yeah, there would be a lot of things to interject. Again, sociologically, you're, what you're saying is perfectly... Okay, that's all, that's all I want. Like, Let me at least make this comment. Okay. Uh, there are states of compound systems that are called entangled states, and they have a very specific and characterizable mathematical structure. Uh, it's not correct to say that if two particles are entangled and uh, in your analogy, one comes heads, then the other has to come tails. There are different kinds of entanglement. Uh, Is that one kind, the kind I just described? One kind. There's another okay. kind where if this one comes heads, then for sure the other one will come heads. There's okay, another that, kind. That, of, doesn't, that doesn't matter for purposes of... There's another kind of entanglement where this one comes head, and 
25% of the time, this one comes heads, and 75% of the time, it comes okay. tails. But let's so stick with no one to one correlation. Okay. But let's stick with a simple case for purposes of exposition. Okay. Let's take okay. a heads tails case. And again, maybe you're right. I'm only sociologically right in the sense that I'm describing what a lot of physicists would describe in a lot of popular yes. articles. But anyway, this is what you hear. What I'm so what you so you send the particles flying off in opposite directions, uh -huh. and you measure one, and its heads, and what physicists are telling us now is that that means that instantaneously, no matter how far away the other particle is, instantaneously, at the exact same moment, mm -hmm. that particle will assume the form of tails. Right. Now, a conventional interpretation might be, well, maybe they were just like, they started off at heads and tails, as is compelled, you know, we knew that. Then they rotated kind of, so to speak. It's like two, two coins rotating at the same velocity as they go apart. And so naturally you measure one and its heads and the other's going to be tails. They're, they're just, they're just, they were in sync to begin with. They've remained in sync. But no, that's not the conventional interpretation of physicists. The physicists would say, no, as we just explained, until you measured it, it did not have either of those properties. So you're measuring the one entangled particle. Forces has a kind, in a certain sense, a kind of influence on the other one, e an instantaneous influence. It forces it to be tails. So that is, in some sense, influence moving faster than the speed of light. Maybe this is what Einstein objected to. I don't know, but, but, but anyway, what that I said, what, what's that? It's exactly what he objected. Okay, it's so like that's what he didn't like. So, so if that's what he didn't like, first of all, I would think that what I just said isn't. Confused. I mean, it's what Einstein saw as following from quantum physics. Yes. So, he, I mean, he Einstein saw that quantum physics implied this kind of instantaneous influence. He said, yes. no, the theory yes. of relativity says things can't move, fa including influence, I guess. Perfect. Can't move fast. Perfect. So Einstein would agree that for, for purposes of exposition, what I've described is fine, right? Yeah, look, you're channeling Einstein. Einstein okay, good. Saying, so, why okay. Would you die saying such bizarre things. Why not just think? And again, you don't don't worry about rotating or anything. Take a coin and slice it down the middle and send one half this way and one half that way. Uh, if heads turns up over here, then tails will turn up over there. Big deal. Einstein saw nothing at all spooky or strange about that phenomenon. And what he was astonished by was that Bohr and the Copenhagen people kept insisting that uh, the coins were neither heads nor tails all along, and therefore they were forced to posit this spooky action at distance, this telepathy that Einstein hated. You're exactly saying what Einstein said. He said, look, the phenomena do not force us to say anything as bizarre as that. Why are you saying this strange? So when I said you might say they are in sync from the beginning, they just stayed in sync, and that yeah. accounts for the measurement, that was his belief. Yeah. That was his belief. So, so, so let me be, get clear on this, because I had been thinking that, you know, he did this as a thought experiment, uh, but since then, the experiment itself has been conducted, and they have found that, yeah, the one is heads, the one is tails, and I had thought that that finding refuted Einstein, but what you're saying is he did not disagree on what the outcome of the experiment would be, just on what the proper interpretation was? Yeah, so there are two steps to this. And, and so the, the, the difficulty is it's very easy to confuse the second step, which we haven't talked about. What we've been talking about so far is exactly the so-called Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen argument, which was in 1935. This was an argument that Einstein gave against standard quantum mechanics. He said standard quantum mechanics cannot be a complete, give you a complete physical description of a system. Why? Because in this funny state, it doesn't attribute either heads or tails to either coin. And he said, well, if neither coin is heads or tails, why do they always come up different? I mean, that would require spooky action at a distance. But if you just say there's more to the system than quantum mechanics recognizes, right. it's easy to account for this. That's, that the was, hidden, that's the hidden variable view. That's the that, hidden variable view. That, that the problem, that the quantum indeterminacy, the reason you can only say with confidence there's a 50% chance it'll be here, 30% chances, you don't know enough about the physical universe at that moment. If you really yeah. knew everything knowable in principle, you would be able to predict it. So the, the yeah. failure of quantum physics to predict things in these cases uh, is just a reflection of ignorance about the universe. Correct. Exactly. That was Einstein's view. He thought that the idea that all these other physicists rejected it 
was literally insane. They had no reason to reject it. And, uh, you know, he died in that state. Now, what he died too early to see was the theorem that John Bell proved in 1963. So what Bell proved, and that nobody had a clue about this, not Bohr or Heisenberg or Schrodinger or Einstein or anybody else before Bell, is that this very simple natural model that Einstein had of things having their values all along, although it can explain the experiment Einstein discussed, there are other experiments it can't explain. That's what Bell proved. That Einstein's solution that gets rid of this non-locality or the spooky action at a distance, it worked for the case he worried about, but it doesn't work for all cases. So, so is there a kind of entanglement that would freak Einstein out that yes, has been done? Absolutely. There is. Einstein turned out to be wrong. There is spooky action at a distance. Bell so, so entanglement of the weird kind happens so far yes. as current experimental results show. Yes, absolutely. You're never going to get rid of it. You, you can't get rid of it. It's not, even a, it's not even a characteristic of quantum mechanics. What Bell showed was that if you just accept the results of certain experiments, and those experiments have been done, and you don't, even if you have no theory, but you just say, you know, I did an experiment, and here are, the, here are the outcomes I got. You can analyze those outcomes and say, the kind of theory Einstein wanted cannot explain this. It's impossible. It's mathematically impossible. Einstein was wrong, but not for reasons that Bohr understood or not for reasons that Heisenberg understood. Einstein was right on target that there was nothing forcing this spooky action at a distance on standard quantum mechanics at the time he wrote. But after Bell and after the tests of Bell, so now we're in the 1970s, then there was reason. And the continuation of those tests that have become more and more rigorous have verified beyond any doubt that there is some, as it were, spooky action at a distance. There is some non-locality that no local theory of the kind Einstein wanted can work. Okay. And, um, Along with that, would you say his hidden variable interpretation has been has to be cast aside? Because yeah. I had heard hidden variable was making a comeback. Her, hidden, this is a different issue than hidden variables. It's, right. If you allow this non-local influence, this you know this yeah. influence of things on each other that are very far away, right? Then you can have a perfectly deterministic theory. Right. And in fact, we've had that theory, at least for all, every single piece of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. The two-slit experiment, uh, you know, the, the so-called Arana bohm effect, anything you think of as a characteristically quantum mechanical effect can be reproduced by a completely deterministic theory. Uh, David Bohm published that theory in 1952. John Bell read Bohm's papers in 1952 and was astonished. Mm -hmm. And that's what got Bell to start thinking about uh, this question. Because in Bohm's theory, the non-locality is very manifest. When you start to analyze the theory, you can just see in the theory that doing something over here can have an effect over here. And so it's a completely deterministic theory. It gets all the quantum predictions correct. And right. Bell asked himself, well, gee, can I somehow get rid of the spooky action at a distance and keep the determinism? Right. And he, what he found is, no, you can't. I mean. Basically, you just can't get you, you you can't get rid of the spooky action at a distance. Right. You, you can't you can keep the spooky action and and you can hang on to the spooky action at a distance and still be deterministic. Yeah. Right, that's you can do that, which is intuitively fine too. I mean, I, I don't think that's hard to conceive. What's right. harder to conceive is the alternative that that the non-deterministic. So so what you're saying so so. so so I have heard that more people are taking the hidden variable interpretation seriously. Yep. And if they're right, that would mean the thing I started out with, right, the idea that before you do the measurement, there is no answer even in principle to the question of where the electron is, that that's wrong, right? Yeah. That, that, that that common idea in quantum okay. physics would have to be wrong if hidden variable is right. That's right. The, the, the theory, the Bohm theory, this is now often called Bohmian mechanics, postulates that there are Particles, regular old point particles that are always somewhere and always move continuously. And if you do an experiment like with a screen that gets a flash and the flash shows up here and you say, where was the electron right before that? In this theory, you say it was just about there. It was just on its way. It was just almost had hit the screen a second before the flash and the flash occurred when it hit the screen. 
Mm-hmm. You say that was what was going on right before the flash. Uh, I guess I'm having uh, trouble then. I, I'm wondering what are the experiments like that do demonstrate uh, non-locality, that, that do demonstrate the, the, the spooky action at a distance, um, but don't involve this idea that the measurement itself is what forced the one particle to assume its state. What are these experiments like? Uh, so the, the, the easiest one to describe, which it, it just depends on what you want to do. If you give me five minutes, I can describe it. If I have 30 seconds, I'm not going to do a great job. We should for now probably go with 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. I, you can do, there's something called the GHZ argument. So this was produced by Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger in the 80s. It's a very beautiful argument, and it describes an experiment where you have actually now three particles rather than two that are in an entangled state, and they separate, okay? And they, they can separate as far as you like. And eventually, each particle will hit a device. You can call it a measurement device. It'll be set of one, one of two ways, either this way or that way. So there are eight possibilities for how they'll all three be set. And what you can prove by a very simple mathematical argument is that the the predictions of quantum mechanics cannot be recovered if you assume that each particle on its own and uninfluenced by the other two is preset for how it will react to either of these experiments it might encounter. If you assume that, right, that what happens over here is just a matter between this particle and this apparatus and has nothing to do with what's going on with the other particles and their apparatus, it's very easy to prove mathematically you cannot recover the predictions of quantum mechanics. So there is no local theory that will give you the right results. But what is forcing it to assume the state it assumed if it's not an interaction with something local in the experiment? It, it's, it, it, it is a dependency on what's going on non-locally. It's a, that, that is... What this particle does over here, uh-huh. and physically on wh- which way a okay. distant apparatus, whether the distance apparatus is like this or like this, right? And you can show in this theory, in certain cases, if the apparatus is like this, you'll get one result here, and if the distant apparatus is I like see. that, so, you'll so, get the, so the one particle encounters something in the physical world that influences its state, and the other particle has to comply in some sense. Yeah, that there is an but, but it's not the case that that it, the only thing we're losing from the original conception of the experiment is the idea that the thing it encountered was a measuring device that turned a previously indefinite state into a definite state. You just don't talk about that. It's just, yeah, it's just I mean, something influenced it, and there was a corresponding change right. in the distant particle. So, uh, again, let me just... Uh, there's a very famous paper by Bell called Against Measurement, quote measurement, where he yeah. says, all this talk would be much improved if you would simply ban the word measurement, okay? Yeah. Just use the word experiment, because measurement has too much baggage that comes along with it. Experiment is just simpler and, and more straightforward. And uh, so you, you have, you know, different kinds of experiment. I can do an experiment where... This device is this way, and this device is this way. I can do an experiment where this one's this way, and this one's this way. I've got three, so I have these different experiments. And what you can prove is that the result I get here cannot be independent of how the other apparatuses, which are very far away, are set. It can't be. And so that's the non-locality. So so is your view, are you like a hidden variables guy? Your view is... Uh, is that Einstein was right about that, but entanglement actually happens, which he didn't think was the case? Uh, there, there are, so once you agree that there's non-locality, the very thing that Einstein didn't like, right. and you ask, okay, I've got to somehow get that into my physics. Uh, you can go a hidden variables route, you can go a non, there are other, there are so-called mm-hmm. objective collapse theories, that's what Roger Penrose likes. There are different moves you can make, as long as you've got the non-locality in there. Mm-hmm. They're all possible moves. They all yield coherent theories, and you shouldn't turn your nose up at any of them. Um, probably my view is that the so-called hidden variables ones are neater and cleaner and look more plausible to me, but that's just an opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't. There, I know very much respect people who are working on other kinds of theories, so I wouldn't take you know my opinion very far. But, but in any event, non-locality is pretty weird, right? Sure. It's the weirdest thing. I would say it's the weirdest thing physics has ever discovered. I would say because in principle, it, it does mean that in principle, 
events halfway around the world could have could influence events here in halfway, halfway across the galaxy and not through conventional means when we think of influence we think of nothing that moves faster than the speed of light conventionally right like they can they can that's say right. something that that's travels right. along an optic fiber that influences us but we think no influence could happen faster but in principle that's it right. could this and, this has to be faster than light it has it has experimentally been proven yeah. that it has to be faster than light and of course this is this is fodder for all kinds of woo stuff right i mean yeah. i mean people who love well, woo are all over this right it, they they do, but they're missing because there's another theorem, another theorem that Bell himself proved, called often called the Nobel Telephone Theorem, which says that N O B E L or N O dash B E L L, N O B E L L, okay. No Bell Telephones, okay. um, which, which is a theorem that shows that quantum mechanics, even though it gives rise to this spooky action at a distance, has to have it in it that spooky action at distance cannot be used for us to send signals. It cannot be used to communicate by, by one party to another party. Yeah. So if the Wu people want to base telepathy on this, they're out of luck. This yeah, but see, see, now here's the thing. I had always thought that that, the fact that you can't use it to communicate, depends on... The part, the, the the idea that the measurement is forcing the particle to to assume some distinct form that you can't predict even in principle, right? I mean, it, it, you can see why if 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 you do some measurement and it's going to uh, force heads or tails, right. but you don't know which, right. then you can't use that to send a signal. But right. if if there if there's if there's uh, hidden variables. And we could, in principle, go, oh, I know what you do. If you want it to be tails, you just move the whatever yeah. physical thing like this, yeah. and that forces it into tails. And we've already told yeah. those people on the other side of the planet that heads means the Red Sox won or whatever. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Right? You so see, you take my point. I mean, if yeah. it, in, a, in a world right. with hidden variables, you yeah. couldn't, couldn't you, in principle, use it to communicate? So you're absolutely right. Okay, everything you said was exactly on target. The question is when you say in principle, what is the relevant principle? Now, if what, what you have to realize is that suppose if what you're saying is if I knew the exact value of the hidden variables, then I could use them to signal. That's right. correct. But we may someday know. No, that's the interesting thing. What you oh, can, man, I'm so bummed out. Okay, because look, think about it. How do you get to know anything? How do you know what's going on on your desk? Okay, how, how do you know? It's kind of an amazing thing. Right now you know what's going on in my room, which is very far away, by a physical interaction, right? Physics itself constrains what we can know because to know means that physically you set up a certain kind of correlation between the target system and your system. And when you carry through the analysis of the hidden variables theories in a very careful way, you get, you, you can prove mathematically a result that's called absolute uncertainty, which says that the physics itself does not allow you to get the requisite knowledge. So if you knew, you could do that, but you can't know. You can't know for physical reasons. No. No machine that has perception and cognition no, could know. No machine that's governed by the laws of physics could know. So there's some like level of resolution, level of fineness below which the universe is unknowable, even though it's not in principle unpredictable. Yes, that's right. Well, that's a disappointment. Well, you know, sometimes things work out that way. You just got to suck it up and move on. It's intriguing in its own way. Uh, well, that's that's something for me to ponder. I think I have enough to ponder. So, um, uh, and we've gone on at least as long as uh, as the laws of physics should allow, uh, whether they do or not. Um, so, what uh, is there anything else you want to say about all this? Um, I do want to say these were really good questions. I want to say that you quite accurately portrayed. Um, was commonly said that anyone hearing me poo pooing everything ought to be shocked and say, What the hell is this guy talking about? and just recommend that 
you go look at some things. Um, for quantum mechanics, there's a nice new book out called What is Real by Adam Becker, um, which everyone should read if you want to know what a mess that is. Um, there's a what nice a mess book, the book is or what a mess quantum what a, me- what a mess quantum mechanics is and uh-huh. how it got that way. It's a uh-huh. nice book about the history of it. Uh, there's a nice book by Travis Norson, which is an introductory level undergraduate physics level introduction to foundations of physics, which goes through all this stuff in a very careful way. So you shouldn't take my word for it, but I hope people are intrigued enough to dig into it. The arguments aren't that hard. Okay. And by the way, to be clear, the last stuff we covered, like, okay, there's the, there, there is the version of non-local influence that where the experiment the interpretation depends on the idea that measurement it forces definite resolution. Right. But then there's this other version um, right. that uh, needn't imply that. And, uh, and, and uh, so hidden variables is uh, consistent with non-local influence. That, 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 that's all kind of conventionally accepted. Is that right? Although, I mean, part of it is, I mean, certainly a lot of mainstream physicists certainly still believe that measurement does create, in a sense, the, the finite the, the reality. I, I honestly do not know what conventional physicists believe. Yeah. Let me tell you a quick story. Adam Becker, just this book just came out. He's been on a tour uh, talking about it. He sent me an email, and he reported he's been going around to physics departments, to you know, audiences with physicists in them, and basically saying the entire Copenhagen interpretation is an incoherent mess and always has been. And not a single physicist has risen to defend it. So what physicists actually believe may not be what you think they believe. There appears that the, the common story that there's this Copenhagen interpretation produced by Bohr and everybody believes that, apparently it's just false. I, I, I think most physicists apparently will not try and defend it or claim they even understand it. And, and that interpretation, although one way it's characterized is kind of don't think too much about the philosophical implications. It, it does involve that. That does the Copenhagen does entail the idea that measurement uh, imposes definiteness yeah. on reality. Yeah. So you you need to separate two things. The original Copenhagen interpretation that's associated with Bohr. There was all kinds of philosophy that went with it. There was a there was a metric ton of bad philosophy that went with it, and you were supposed to spout this incomprehensible philosophy and then calculate. It was only when it came to the United States and we were much more practically minded that instead of spout a lot of gibberish and calculate, you just said, well, let's cut out the first part, shut up and calculate. Well, and so shut up and calculate was not Copenhagen. It's just a very practical minded thing that says, don't, you know, let's not worry about all that. We're getting the right numbers. Let's just keep going. Okay. All right, uh, which I guess you would say is an improvement on spout a lot of gibberish and then calculate. Yeah, right? if you, as long as you admit that there's work to be done, and the work is physics and not philosophy. If right. you're not, you know, you as a philosopher, you don't, you don't want to shut up. You want to think about what it means. And as a physicist, you don't want to say, gee, I have no idea what's going on in an atom. I know that these numbers right. come out right, but right. I can't tell you, begin to answer straightforward physical questions about what's going on. Okay. Well, thank you. And where can people find your stuff? Like, are you on Twitter or anything, or is there a website you'd steer them to? Or? I am not on Twitter. Um, I may have a website. I intend to have a website that will come online hopefully within a, a, a couple months. Um, what will it be called? It will be called Hone and Refine. H-O-N-E and yeah. Refine? Yes, Hone and Refine. That is the name. Okay. Yeah, so in a future that may or may not already exist, people should Google Hone and Refine. Yeah. One thing for sure, the future does not yet exist because then it wouldn't be the future. Well, there are people who disagree with you. I'm not necessarily one of them. But I just, it, it's, I, it's incumbent on me to point out that there are. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Tim. This was a lot of fun. Okay. Ciao. Okay.